Hi, this is Professor Dorr, and this is lecture number eight of EE310. The lecture is titled Phasers and Impedance. Now, what we found in lecture seven is that when a circuit is fed with a sinusoidal input, all the voltages and currents in the circuit will be sinusoidal, and they will all have the exact same frequency as the input. Or in other words, what the circuit does is it changes, it scales the amplitude of the input and it shifts the phase of the input and that's what you see at the output. So you put a sine wave into a circuit at some amplitude and anywhere you look in that circuit, you're going to see a sine wave with the same frequency but the amplitude and the phase will be shifted. So when the circuit excitation is complex, meaning that we know we're really putting a cosine into the circuit, but since the cosine uh, can be represented as e to the j omega t plus e to the minus j omega t divided by two, it's really a set of counter rotating vectors so what we do is we just feed the circuit with that positive rotating vector, that counterclockwise uh, vector. And so when the excitation is complex, the amplitude and uh, scaling and phase shifting can easily be done by just multiplying the input amplitude times the scale value, which comes from the circuit, of course, and adding the exponents because that's where the phase is, e to the j phi. So the transfer function is the ratio of the circuit output to the circuit input, and it's generally complex. So let's look at a transfer function. Um, H is a typical, is a good letter for transfer functions. You see that quite a bit. And it could be V out divided by V in. In that case, the transfer function is unitless. It's um, just a, just a um, multiplicative complex constant. Or we could say the transfer function is equal to the current in R2 divided by the voltage in. In this case, since H is a current divided by a voltage, it's actually a conductance. And since the current is in one place and the voltage is in another, we call it a transconductance because it represents signals in different places. You'll see that term quite a bit when you get into EE330 and we start working with semiconductor devices. Or a transfer function might be the output current IO divided by the input current IN. So to get the output, multiply the input by the transfer function. Now a phaser is a complex number that we use to re represent a sinusoid. And we have a couple of ways we can represent sinusoids. We can say V of T is equal to V max why do I say V max? Because I know that the peak magnitude of the cosine is going to be one. So V max is going to be the maximum value of this signal. So V of T equals V max cosine omega T plus phi, where omega is the radian frequency, which is two pi times the frequency in Hertz. And Omega T shows a linearly increasing phase angle, right? And then phi is just the phase offset. We can think of it as um, the phase when T is zero, because if T was zero, this would be zero and we just have cosine phi. So this is a very general way to describe a sine wave because we're describing its magnitude, we're describing its frequency, and we are describing its phase offset. So what we found is that we can streamline the circuit analysis by using complex excitation. 
a lot of you have probably done phaser problems before, but you didn't know you were using complex um, uh, excitations, but now you know. So in that case, let's just represent the counterclockwise rotating vector because we know the clockwise one follows that counterclockwise one like a little dog, right? If we know where this one is, we know where this one is. So why do all the analysis? So we streamline our input by using just the that uh, counterclockwise rotating vector and we get V max, which is of course the um, radius of our spinning vector. There's a factor of two in there. I don't get real excited about that factor of two when I'm talking conceptually. V max times E to the J omega T plus phi. And you might say, why is V max the radius of this thing? I'm so, yeah, why is V max the radius of the circle that that vector is going to cut out? Because we could use Euler's, form, uh, Euler's formula to say that e to the j, j phi, we'll just call this phi, is equal to cosine phi going that way plus j sine phi going this way. And sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. That's the hypotenuse. Okay, so... This is our complex um, uh, equation for our sine wave. Now what let's do is let's separate our two components here and we'll say that V of T is equal to V max times E to the J omega T times E to the J phi. And what this reminds us is that we can shift the phase of a sine wave or shift the phase of a complex exponential by phi by just multiplying it by e to the j phi. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to streamline things some more. I'm going to say that v is equal to v max times e to the j phi. And what I've done is this is no longer an exact rep representation anymore because it doesn't have the frequency in it. But for phaser analysis, it's good enough for us. Think of all those engineers at San Diego Gas and Electric who do all this work with 60 hertz or 377 radians per second. They don't want to write that down every time. So they represent their sine wave by dumping the e to the j omega t and just leaving the maximum value and the phase offset. And from there, we get to phaser notation where we say big V, that's, gonna, that's a bold V, but I couldn't scratch that out here, is equal to V max at an angle of phi. And that's our phaser do, uh, notation. So when you see um, a sine wave described this way, you have to have the frequency some other way. Somebody has to say, by the way, the frequency is 60 hertz, and here's your input voltage. And now you've completely described it. So to show this equivalence, we use a little double arrow thingy here. And what this double arrow thing, which is shown in our book, here's V of T in the sign, the time domain. Here it is in the phaser domain. But in the phaser domain, somebody's got to tell you the frequency. So for an inductor, we know, and people have known for hundreds of years, that the voltage is equal to L di dt. We used that quite a bit when we were talking about thuds and boings in chapter 8. Um, but that equation works for any inductor, anytime, anywhere. And similarly, for a capacitor, I is equal to C dv dt. So if I can represent V by a phaser. 
If I can represent V with a phaser, how do I represent dV dt? Well, let's start off by just using the time domain version. Here is a sinusoid. What's its derivative? The derivative of the cosine is minus the sine. And we, of course, bring the omega along in our derivative. So dV dt is going to be minus V sub m times omega times the sine of omega t plus v. So now I'd like that to look like a cosine again. So I use my little identities or I draw a few pictures and say that the sine is equal to the cosine minus pi over 2. Uh, if you don't believe that, draw a couple little pictures. That's what I always have to do. So now I've got it back to a cosine. And one thing I can see here is that my cosine is this expression is actually scale, it is actually my original expression scaled by omega and shifted by pi over 2. So when you take the derivative of a sine wave, you are shifting the phase by pi over 2 or 90 degrees. It's kind of cool. So now what let's do is let's take our expression for dv dt and let's just, we know that expression for dv dt is a pair of counter rotating vectors. Let's just keep the upper one. And here's what we get minus v max times omega times e to the j omega j omega t plus v minus pi over 2. So here's our derivative as a phasor. And I can also divide or separate out my phase terms. And I have v minus v max times omega times e to the j omega t. That's this one times e to the j phi, which is that one times e to the minus j pi over 2. Hmm. What does e to the minus j pi over 2 look like? Let's use Euler's identity. e to the j phi is just cosine phi plus j sine phi. And in this case, phi is pi over 2. So the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. And j sine, sorry, of minus pi over 2 is 0. And j sine of minus pi over 2, this goes to negative 1. So it's just minus j. So e to the minus j pi over 2 is just negative j. So now we look at this again, and I'm going to take my e to the minus j pi over 2, and I'm going to represent it here as just that j. So now I have v max times j omega e to the j omega t times e to the j phi. And one thing I see about this is if I were to represent this as just its, its one vector, it would just be v max e to the j omega t plus phi. And here I have v max e to the j omega t plus phi if I, if I put these phase angles together, but it's multiplied by j omega m. So getting rid of the e to the j omega t, because I really want to treat this as a phaser, so I get rid of that e to the j omega t, dv dt is equal to v max times j omega times e to the j phi or v max times j omega e to the j phi equals j omega times phi. Or in other words, if I, if I know the phasor representation of some voltage and I want dv dt, I just multiply it by j omega. 
So taking the derivative, it scales. When I take the derivative, I'm going to get a different amplitude and I'm going to get a 90 degree phase shift. So let's look at this again. I've got a sine wave and I want to get dv dt. I want to get its derivative. Here's a sine wave, right? It's going the derivative is the slope. Okay. And if I increase the frequency of the sine wave, now it's doing more, it's doing, it's going faster. So instead of having two cycles here, I've got 10 cycles here. So obviously the slope is getting, is increasing, right? So that is represented in my equation here. As the frequency increases, J omega or omega increases, my derivative increases. So I like where I'm seeing that omega. What does the J do? What it does is shifts the phase by 90 degrees. So we can represent the derivative of a sine wave by multiplying the original phaser by J omega. Now, this isn't a derivation. This is just a whole bunch of operations that kind of meandered through some of these kind of calculations. Do them yourself and just kind of get some skill uh, at using these. And if anybody ever says that e to the minus j pi over 2 is equal to minus j, you know that you can show that simply with Euler's uh, equation. So we showed how to do the derivative, and to get the integral of v, just divide it by j omega. So let's get back to inductors and capacitors. For an inductor, v equals L d i d t. Or using phasers, what I can say is that big V or boldface V is equal to J omega L times bold face current through the inductor because V equals L D I D T. If I know that I is just bold face I, D I D T is just going to be J omega L times bold face I. Calculus turns into algebra. So the impedance of the inductor is V over I, which is going to be J omega L. Now let's look at our capacitor. For the capacitor, I is equal to C dV dt. So um, big I or bold face I is going to be equal to C times J omega times the phasor quantity V. And so the impedance of the capacitor is going to be V over I, which is going to be 1 over J omega C. We get that from right here. So we have three ways to represent a phasor. We can say that um, Z is equal to X plus JY. We can um, say that Z is equal to R times E to the J phi. Or we can use our shorthand of Z equals um, some radius at an angle of phi, or like if it was a voltage V max at an angle of phi. So what we've done in the last lecture and this lecture is we've taken these magic things called phasers and we've just kind of pulled them down to earth so we have a good idea where they come from. Now we're going to start using that streamline method and I encourage you try to keep track of where they came from. Let's do an example problem to build up some chops in this area. This isn't the kind of problem that you're going to see a lot of in EE310 because it's a differential equation 
and the math department is is down the hall. But it really does uh, give a nice illustration of how we can use phasers to solve differential equations. So I want to determine V of T when I know that dV dt plus 50 volts, uh, dV dt plus 50 V plus 100 times the integral of V dt. Um, I'm not going to worry about the limits for now because I don't want to get that specific, um, though in theory I should, but I'm not, is equal to 110 times the cosine of 377 T minus 10 degrees. So this is a very strange way to show a cosine because a cosine really we're showing cosine of phi, right, of some phase angle. And in this silly book notation, 377T is an angle in radians and then they throw in an angle in degrees. So be careful with that while you're doing problems. Um, it's pretty standard in the industry to do it that way, so I do it in my class, but I just want you to be um, uh, ready for it. So let's see, 377T, every single engineer with a PE license at San Diego Gas and Electric says, well, that's 60 hertz. 377 radians per second divided by 2 pi. Yeah, that's going to give you 60 hertz. So what we're going to do is convert that equation to phasor domain. So dV dt, well, I don't know what big V is. This is boldface V here, but I know the derivative of it is just going to be J omega times big V plus 50 little v, 50 little v's is 50 big v's, plus 100 times the integral of v dt, and that integration is going to be just v divided by j omega, is equal to, let's take this and put it in um, phasor notation, 110 at minus 10 degrees. And so, and everybody knows what that sound is. Um, so we have now taken our differential equation and put it into the phasor domain. And yeah, I wasn't real careful about the limits. Let's just not worry about that for now. Um, some of you might be saying, he's just using properties of Laplace transforms. You're darn right I am. You're darn right I am. But for right now, we're calling it phasers. So, because in EE310, one of the cool things about it, and one of the reasons I like teaching it so much, is there's a bazillion trillion little trap doors that everything is connected through. <laughs> and I could spend the whole class telling you about trap doors, but um, sometimes I like to point them out and sometimes I just like to tantalize you uh, with them. Okay, so I took my equation from the um, differential equation domain into the phasor domain. Uh, when we do this with Laplace transforms, we'll be very careful about these limits and the initial conditions, but here we're not. Um, and there's actually a reason for that, and we're, we're going to get to that in a second. But um, the, the short reason for it is because we are not dealing with the transient, we're just dealing with the steady state response. So here's our equation in the phasor domain, and I look at it just like the seagull looks at those McDonald's bags at the garbage can at the beach, and I say one equation, one unknown. So that seagull's going to find him some French fries. So let's multiply everything out by this denominator. So I get J omega squared here plus 50 V times J omega plus 100 V plus J omega times 110 at minus 10 degrees. And now I factor out my V's so that I can isolate V all by itself. And I've got this cool equation. 
but doesn't look super easy to solve. But by the time you're done with this class, this equation is going to be real easy to solve. So how do I handle this J? How do I handle this 110 at an angle of minus 10? They're two very different looking things. Um, one thing I can do is just say, you know, J is really equal to just um, e to the um, j pi over 2, right? j is equal to e to the j pi over 2, just from Euler's um, identity. So I could make this thing look like this. And now I'd have 1 at an angle of 90 times 110 at an angle of minus 10. Well, at least they look the same on the top but they look different than what I have downstairs. So I think what I'm going to do instead is instead of converting this to phasor notation, I'm going to convert this into just a complex number. So that's why I say, or I could convert 110 at minus 10 degrees to rectangular form. So 110, this is really 110, except the paper punch went through it, at minus 10 degrees is, let me show you how I do this. And it's kind of silly and it's kind of old people-ish, but it's a really good way to do it that's worked for me for a long time. Some of your calculators will have functions to do this for you, and you're welcome to use those. But I always do this stuff by hand just because it reminds me of uh, how to do it and what it means. So the 110, we're just going to bring along with us. It's just a scaling coefficient, right? And so what I'm going to say is minus 10. Um, well, first of all, I want my e to the minus j phi, right? Because that's what we want to make it look like. But that phase angle has to be in radians. Right, my 110 at an angle of minus 10 degrees, I can go up to my ways of representing a phasor and I'm saying, I want this one. Actually, I want this one eventually, but I'm going to start by getting this one. So here we go. I'm going to say 110 at an angle of minus 10. Well, Minus 10 divided by 360 gives me the fraction of how far around a circle I am, right? I'm 10 degrees out of 360 degrees. And I know that 2 pi radians is the same thing as one rotation in radians. So 10 over 360 relates my angle to a fraction of how far around the circle I am, and then I multiply it by 2 pi because that's how many radians there are going around the circle. Now, if that didn't make sense, maybe stop the tape and look at that because I know this is really a dumb little thing, but it really helps me out and it keeps me from making those silly mistakes. So, this is going to be equal to 110, multiply all this stuff out at, a, at 110 times e to the minus j, 0.1745. And now I'm going to use Euler's theorem or Euler's identity and say that's 110 times cosine of minus 0.1745 plus j sine 0.1745. And I multiply that out. I'm sorry, I take my cosine, my sine, and I put them here. Now, so what? But what, what I've done is now everything looks the same, doesn't it? So I can, in MATLAB, this is very easy to evaluate. This is very easy to evaluate. In your calculator, it is too. Bottom line, I don't care how you calculate complex numbers. But just get good at it because you have to do it really quickly on the quizzes. So now I've got a nice little formula. Um, I just have to put my omega in there. And I know omega equals 377 radians per second because uh, 60 hertz. Um, 
377 radians per second. And I shove all this into my calculator or MATLAB. I get V equals minus 0.0123 minus J.2892. If I were to plot that, it's going to look like, let's see, a negative real part, a negative imaginary part, and I got a little real part and a big negative imaginary part. So when I convert it to polar form, that minus 90 degrees doesn't surprise me because my negative real part was only 0.01, but my negative imaginary part was 0.28. So I know I'm going to be pretty close. So I'm just kind of watching those numbers as they go by to make sure they make sense, because that's going to help me keep from making, you know, some kind of gross uh, sign error or degrees to radians error. So now I just go back and forth between my time domain and um, uh, phasor domain equations, and I say V of T is equal to 0.289 times cosine 377T minus 92.4 degrees. And of course, how did I go from here to here? I used my equivalences. Um, right here. Use my equivalences. All right, so let's look at some network kind of formulas. And I can actually just jump to the end of the page and I can say adding components in series um, works when you're using phasers, um, adding impedances in series and adding impedances in parallel work. Just use the same formulas as resistors, except the numbers are complex. Superposition holds, Stevenin's theorem holds, all that stuff holds. It's just the numbers are complex now, but let's take a quick look. Impedance is equal to V over I. And both of these are phasers. For an, an inductor, I have Z sub L equals J omega L and Z C equals 1 over J omega C. You're going to do so many sinusoidal problems in this um, class that I want you to remember that these impedances only work for sinusoidal signals because remember we derive these using sinusoid. If you want to know what an inductor or a capacitor do with a non-sinusoidal signal, um, V equals LDI dt, I equals CDV dt. So these only hold for sine waves. The impedance of a resistor is R. Because remember, a resistor is not defined by a differential equation. It's just defined by a linear relationship. If I put two impedances in series, the series impedance, Zs, is equal to Z1 plus C2. If I put um, impedance in parallel, Zp is going to be Z1, Z2 divided by Z1 plus C2, just like you would for resistors, except these are complex. KVL minus V plus I1Z1 plus I2Z2 equals zero. But instead of I being a, um, a DC current, like you may have been used to in E210, now I is a phasor current. And when I'm adding all these up, it's a vectorial addition. Or in other words, if I were to add up just the magnitudes of the voltages across these devices, just the magnitudes, they wouldn't add up to zero. I got to add them as vectors because those all have phase angles, 
But when I add them up as vectors, then they're going to come back to zero. Like if I have a little set of axes here and I add those, those three voltages, I'm going to have that vector going that way, that vector going that way, that vector going this way, and it's going to come right back to zero. So KVL holds, KCL holds, superposition holds. So we're just taking what you know, and we're just extending a little bit. And I want you to remember that what we're doing now is steady state AC. We're not dealing with the transient like we did in chapter eight. And I'm going to make a couple of more comments about that, because sometimes students kind of get confused between <laughs> chapter eight and the AC analysis. Let's do a problem. I've got a circuit here, and I want to find this current at different frequencies. So I want to find it at omega equals zero hertz, omega equals one hertz. I'm, boy, I messed that up. Omega equals zero radians per second, one radian per second, five radian per second, 10 radians per second, and infinite radians per second. Omega, that means radians per second. That's just so common in industry that when you see omega, that's radians per second. When you see F, that's hertz. So now let's look at the circuit, knowing that we want to get this current when we as we change the um, frequency of our input source. This input source is four times the cosine of omega t, and apparently there's no offset phase angle. So it's not omega t plus 10 degrees. It's just 4 cosine omega t. And let's see, we got an inductor here. We got a resistor here in parallel with this capacitor. Sounds good. Now I want to get into this comment where I said that, hey, all this stuff is steady state. Chapter 8 was transient. So let's say, let's turn everything off in this circuit. So everything's off. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on this, um, um, this voltage supply. What do we know? We know we can't change the current in that inductor real quickly, and we can't change the voltage across the capacitor instantly. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to turn this rascal on, and I know I'm going to get my little thud and boing going on. See, I got a little exponential envelope kind of going on here, and I got some boinginess going on because my circuit has this forced excitation. But the point that I want to make is that when I first turn it on, I'm going to get some kind of transient right? And once that transient has died off, once the circuit's done figuring out what it wants to do with that sine wave that's coming in, I end up with a steady state sine wave. That steady state sine wave is not changing amplitude. So in chapter eight, we weren't putting sine waves into circuits, we were putting steps in. And we found that at t equals t equals zero, it went poof or boing or thud or something. Um, and then it ended up at some, some steady state value. Well, go up a level in your thinking. Here, we're going to turn on this source, and it's not going to immediately jump to its steady state AC value. But for all the problems we're going to do with steady state and in frequency response and Bode plots, all that stuff, we are looking at the steady state of the circuit. The cool thing about Laplace transforms at the end of this course is we can do both. With Laplace transforms, we can actually solve for this whole mess, which is pretty cool. But here, all this math we did up here is for steady state AC, and that is this. 
Steady state AC is the response to forced excitation. And remember, if we excite a circuit with a 100 radian per second sine wave, and we turn that 100 radian per second sine wave, and we wait a while for it to come to steady state, we know any point in the circuit, this current, this voltage, this current, this current, they're all going to be 100 hertz. They're just going to have a different amplitude and a different phase than the input of the circuit. OK, so in our problem, we were asked to find the response at a bunch of different frequencies. And I actually added a few to the list that were in the example because I felt I could connect it to more things. So let's get, let's start off doing our AC steady analysis, analysis, steady state is what I was trying to say, at omega equals zero. Four times cosine of zero T, that's four times cosine of zero, that means four times one. At omega equals zero, this sucker is DC source, isn't it? Because omega is equal to zero, and there's no phase angle here. So four times the cosine of zero is four. So at omega equals zero, I got a DC problem. So let's think of it that way. At omega equals zero, this is just DC. So at DC, let's put our chapter eight hats on, and this is four volts. I got no voltage across the inductor, so this is four volts. So that means I got two amps going down here because four divided by two is two amps. I got no current here, so two amps here. That means I got two amps here by KCL on the fly, and it's DC. See that? I got the answer at omega equals zero by inspection because I recognized that I was just putting DC uh, in as my source, and I know how to do that. Now let's go to omega equals infinity because that's another easy one. So here I'm going to say, I got a really high frequency going on. And I know that my inductor impedance is equal to J omega L. And omega is infinity. Hey, so that means my inductor impedance is infinite. Can't get any current through an infinite impedance, right? Looks like an open circuit because its impedance is really high at infinite hertz. So um, I can say that the current here is going to be zero. So those were two easy cases. And when I give you quizzes or exams, I often want you to pick off those easy cases. I want you to look at a problem like this, and if, if you're having a tough time on the exam, I want you to go, yikes, find I sub t at omega, blah, 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 and infinity. Hey, I can get this, and I can get this in about 30 seconds, and that means I can at least um, get some partial credit on this thing. So I will often um, set things up so that if you can use if you can use the concepts that we just used, you can get some quick partial credit. So now let's do the hard ones. We got to get I sub T at omega equals 1, 5, and 10 radians per second. So let's take our circuit, and I'm going to just call this Z sub L because I don't feel like drawing the inductor, and this is Z sub R, and this is Z sub C. And that, what I really want to get is I. So as far as I is concerned, these could just as well be one component. What's that component? It's the resistor impedance in parallel with the capacitor impedance. You'll see this little notation that I use all the time. It's used very commonly in industry. 
just says the resistor impedance in parallel with the capacitor impedance. So now as far as my current is concerned, I see Z sub L plus this parallel combination. Z sub L plus the parallel combination. Z sub L plus the parallel combination. See, I gobbled the circuit up into just one component. So now I can start to think about how to calculate it. I is equal to V, which is four at an angle of zero. So I'm gonna just toss the angle of zero because I don't really need it. Um, divided by my impedance, which is Z sub L plus Z sub R in parallel with ZC. So now it's time to start putting in formulas. But of course, you know that I'm in no hurry to use numbers because numbers, for me anyway, I'm going to make mistakes. And I want partial credit. And it's much easier for the grader to see J omega L and J omega C and stuff like that than giving him all these crazy numbers that, you know, became wrong several steps up. That sounds terrible, but. It's just true. So for I, we got four divided by Z sub L, it's J omega L, plus the resistor impedance in parallel with the capacitor impedance. That's going to be R times one over J omega C divided by R plus one over J omega C. Parallel components, right? Parallel impedances. So now it looks like I'm going to multiply top and bottom by R plus 1 over J omega C. So I'm going to get one of those up here. And I'm going to get one multiplying by here. And I'm going to end up with this expression. And it looks like I wanted to make it even cuter. So I multiplied out these parentheses and I multiplied out these parentheses. And then I multiplied top and bottom by J omega C. Why did I do that strategically? What's guiding me? I see a bunch of J omega C's in the denominator. So I can make it look better if I multiply it out. And maybe I'll get more insight into the problem when the numbers are, or the math is a little cleaner. So let's multiply by J omega C, top and bottom. 4R times J omega C plus 4. And I multiply by this, this by J omega C. And now I'm going to have two J's, and that's going to give me a negative 1, right? So I minus, that's what happened to my J squared, omega squared LRC plus J omega L plus R. So... Now, apparently, I decided that I'd factor that 4 out. Um, and I end up with this expression for i. Very easy to put into your calculator. Very easy to put in MATLAB. But I got an expression. And I did a bunch of math and a bunch of algebra to get it. So if you're anything like me, you probably screwed it up and made a mistake. So I'm always looking for little places where I can check my work. Here's an expression for I. I know what I is if omega is equal to zero, and I know what I is if omega is equal to infinity, because I can see it just by looking at the circuit. So let's just check our equation. At omega equals zero, I have I equals four times one plus zero divided by r minus, whoop, that's a zero, whoop, that's a zero. I have four over r, which is four over two. Hey, that's two amps. That's what we got when we triage this thing at omega equals zero. So that gives me a little bit of a warm and fuzzy, but we also know omega equals infinity. We know the answer there. So let's put in infinity. Four times one plus infinity, um, and then here I have r minus infinity squared plus infinity. Looks like I got a four times infinity, 
and then I got an infinity squared down here. So if I factor out my infinities, don't tell anybody in the math department I'm doing this, it's going to be 4 over infinity. That's going to give me 0. Or, uh, and that matches um, what I saw just by looking at the circuit and saying that inductor had an infinite impedance at infinite hertz. So I'm not promising you my equation's right, but I wasn't able to prove that it was wrong. And I would call that a warm and fuzzy. So now, uh, since I have to calculate this at a few different frequencies, 1, 5, and 10 radians per second, it's time to use my calculator. So I, I'm just going to make a table. And I'm going to say, here's omega. Here is my complex value for my current i. And here is my um, magnitude of i, here's my angle, and here is my expression for i as a function of t. So since I'm here, I'm going to remind you of our silly book notation again, where we'll say that i is 0.442, looks like we're doing this one right here cosine 10t, 10, this is in radians, minus 83.6 degrees. That's really dumb, but get used to it because they use it in industry, so we're going to use it in this course. Now, if you're in my class, I've posted um, the result, the answer, sorry, the solution in MATLAB to this problem, um, because if you haven't used MATLAB, this little script um, shows how you can use it to solve a problem like this. Um, and you can see what I did is I put in my components, and then I put in omega equals 1, omega equals 5, omega equals 10. And in, in this particular thing, you can see I've commented out omega equals 1 and omega equals 5, and I've uncommented omega equals 10. And now I'm going to get my component impedances at this frequency, ZR, ZL, and ZC. And then I'm going to use one of my intermediate equations that just said I is just equal to 4 divided by Z1 plus ZR, ZC, blah, blah, blah. Now, I could have said I is equal to this. But when it's so easy in MATLAB, why would I ever do that when I can say I is equal to this? Why? Because between here and here, I might have made a bunch of errors. So what I did in MATLAB is I calculated ZL, ZR, ZC, and then I shoved them into this equation because that's a lot less error prone. You're going to see later on in this class, I'm going to say, give me an unreduced equation for whatever. And the reason I do that is I don't want you to make math mistakes. I want, I want to know that you can write the equation. I mean, of course, in industry, you're going to write the equation. Hopefully, you get it right, and then you go get a cup of coffee and take a little break and hang out with your friends a little bit. That's what I do. And then you're going to come back, and you're going to bash through all this stuff, and you're going to make a mistake, and you're going to get a preposterous result, and then you're going to go back and you find the mistake is between here and here. Um, and then you're going to fix it. And that's all good. But in this class, um, I'm going to give you the opportunity on your quizzes, just give me the first equation you write, because I don't want to see any errors. And I don't want to dock you for any of those errors. So this MATLAB script is posted. Um, if you're watching this on the internet, it's not too hard to type it in. So if you're new to MATLAB, it's kind of a nice little 
introduction. Um, MATLAB is insanely useful. Um, I use MATLAB and Excel for so many things. Okay, now let's do another problem where I want to find the equivalent impedance between A and B. Here's A, here's B. This is a mess. So I want to find the equivalent impedance. So the first thing that I notice about this problem is Professor Dorr said, you got to tell me the frequency if you're using phasers. But in this case, the, re the reason you need the frequencies is so that you can say Z sub L is equal to J omega L and Z C is equal to one over J omega C. But here I did that for you. And so you'll see that your capacitors are all minus J. Why? Because it's one over J omega C and one over J is equal to minus J. And you're going to say, hey, professor, you didn't derive this. And I'm going to say, hey, students, you go derive it because it's fun and it'll help you work with complex numbers. But that's why your capacitors have negative J's and your inductors have positive J's. So, no, you didn't get the frequency. You got the actual impedance. So I just uh, gave you um, part of the problem. So how am I ever going to find the impedance between A and B? Think of that seagull at Moonlight Beach. He's looking at that bag, and he doesn't know whether there's any French fries in it. He can smell a few French fries because, in our case, we're told to find this impedance. So, uh, and the problem is in our book. So we can probably find the impedance, but we got to peck around a little bit, just like the seagull does, to find it. So here's a strategy I'm going to throw out. What I really want to do, I want to know this impedance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one volt AC into this circuit. And then I'm going to find the node voltages A, B, and C. So I could do that. And then let's see. I in right here is going to be equal to V in divided by J6. That's the piece that goes this way, plus V in minus VC divided by minus J4. That's the current going this way, plus V in minus VA divided by two ohms. So see that? What I'm going to do, I'm going to put a voltage here, and then I'm going to say how much current went that way, how much current went that way, and how much current went that way, because that is going to be my I in. Then I can say that V in divided by I in, right here, V in divided by I in is equal to Z in. Everybody good with that strategy? Because that, that, that strategy looks like it might work. So just like the seagull, um, I made a wrong turn here. I said, let's get the, uh, let's get do KCL at the input node. So I got kind of excited about doing that. And then I realized, just like the seagull sometimes realizes partway through, so what am I doing? I already know the voltage at the input node. So no need for this. Use nodes A, B, and C only. And I left this here because I wanted you guys to see that I was just pecking just like the seagull does. So we want to get um, we want to get the equivalent impedance, but what we've, we've strategized it down to is we're going to put one volt AC in and we're going to figure out this current.
So we're on the hunt to find this, this current. And to find that current, we need all the node voltages because we're eventually going to use this equation. So here we go. KCL at node A. We've got VA. Looks like we're going to sum currents leaving. So VA minus VN divided by 2 plus VA divided by J omega L or divided by JA plus VA minus VB divided by J6 equals 0. And here is my first equation. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to massage that equation a little bit before I leave it. And I'm going to take my VAs and put them together. So you can see the 1 half, the 1 over J8, the uh, minus 1 over J6. And I'm going to put my VBs together and my VCs together and my constants together. And then I'm going to say, OK, I'm done with node A for a while. Now let's go to node B. So at node B, again, we're going to sum currents leaving the node. VB minus VA divided by minus J6, it's this current, plus VB divided by J8, that's this current, plus VB minus VC divided by 4 is that current equals 0. Is that what we did? Yep, here's that equation. And I'm going to do the same drill that I did here. Before I leave this, I'm going to put my VA terms together. Here they are. And my VB terms together. And my VC terms together. And you're probably figuring out why I'm doing this, but I'm not going to say why yet. I'm going to move on to node C. So let's take a look at node C. I see VC minus VN divided by negative J4. That's going out that way plus VC minus VB divided by 4. That's the current going this way. Plus VC divided by J12. That's the current going down here. And those added together give me 0. So this better be what I just said. And again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate out my VA terms, my VB terms, and my VC terms, and my constant. Now you're going to see why I did this. Because I have three equations in three unknowns. My unknowns are VA, VB, and VC. VA, B, VB, and VC. And my three equations <clears throat> are the, um, the node equations at these three nodes. So I got three equations in three unknowns, and I'm going to slap those. I tell you, the seagull at this point is going so fast, he may even get hot french fries. Because we know we got three equations and three unknowns. We can solve this. Here is our first equation. This was KCL at node A. And remember how I gathered up my VA terms, my VB terms, and my VC terms. Now let's go to KCL at node B. Here are my VA terms, my VB terms, and my VC terms. So you can see what I did is here I just took this and this became a row of my matrix. This became another row of my matrix and this became a third row. Uh, this became the third row of my matrix. So here it all is. And these are those three equations. This stuff times VA plus this stuff times VB plus zero times VC equals VN over two. This times VA plus this stuff times VB 
plus this times VC equals zero and so forth. Fourth. So looks pretty ugly, looks pretty complicated. You will be expected to do this on quizzes. So make sure you got good chops for all these complex quantities. So from here, I compute VA, VB, and VC. And now with VA, VB, and VC, I'm going to go back to my strategy. IN is equal to VN over J6. We know that because we know VN, it's one volt, plus VN minus VC over J4. I know VC, so I know all that stuff plus Vn minus Va divided by 2. And I add those together, that gives me In. Now I divide Vn, which is 1 volt at zero phase angle, divided by In, and that gets me Zn, and that is what I was asked to get. So again, um, I posted um, this in MATLAB because I wanted to um, give you an example of how to uh, work with these complex matrices. So you don't have to spend a lot of time learning how to do that. But you can use MATLAB. You can use your TI-89. You can use your Inspire calculator. Um, I use MATLAB because it's easiest for me. but you use whatever is best for you. Um, if you have a calculator, I mean, I might kind of push you toward using that um, because once we get away from these online classes, uh, you're going to be using your calculators uh, on the exams again. Okay, so that includes that, um, that concludes this lecture. So I will see you at the le next lecture. Uh, hopefully, I will see you at office hour.